Hello, everybody. Welcome to Patriots History of the United States. I'm your host, Larry Swikart, co-author of Patriots History of the United States with Michael Allen. As always, we'll be reading from the 15th anniversary edition. If you have an earlier edition, the page numbers may not match up, but the headers usually will. If you're back before 2010's edition, the headers may not match up either. You'll have to just kind of wing it and figure out where we are. But we are in the uh, chapter five and the header on page 165 called <clears throat> Growing America. Adams handed over to Jefferson a thriving energetic republic that was changing before his very eyes. A large majority of Americans remained farmers Yet increasingly, critics expanded and gained more influence over the national culture at a rate that terrified Jefferson. Baltimore, Savannah, Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston all remained central locations for trade, shipping, and intellectual life. But new population centers such as Cincinnati, Mobile, Richmond, Detroit, Fort Wayne, Chicago, Louisville, and Nashville surfaced as regional hubs. New York gradually emerged as a more dominant city than even Boston or Philadelphia. A manumission society there worked in slavery and had won passage of a gradual manumission act of 1799. Above all, by the way, I think that's the first slave emancipation act in human history. I have to check that out, but I think it is. Above all, New York symbolized the transformation in city government that occurred in most urban areas in the early 1800s. Government, instead of an institution that relied on property holdings of a few as its source for power, evolved into, quote, a public body financed largely by taxation and devoting its energies to distinctly public concerns. A city like New York, this fan bugs me so hang on still kind of warm here in arizona got about another month of this and we're done city like new york despite its advances and refinements still suffered from problems that would jolt modern americans an oppressive stench coming from the thousands of horses cattle dogs cats and other animals that walked the streets pervaded the atmosphere by 1850, one estimate put the number of horses alone in New York City at 100,000, which produced 6,300 tons of manure and 1.4 million gallons of urine a week. Cattle, which drank more than 20 gallons of water a day, produced even more urine. And when living creatures did not suffice to stink up the city, the dead ones did. <clears throat> City officials had to cope with hundreds of carcasses per week, hiring out the collection of these dead animals to entrepreneurs. Human bodies mysteriously turned up, too. By mid-century, the New York City coroner's office, always underfunded, was paying a bounty to anybody collecting bodies from the Hudson River. Hand-to-hand -hand combat actually broke out on more than one occasion between the aquatic pseudo-ambulance drivers who both claim the same floating cadaver and, of course, its reward. <clears throat> Most important, though, the urban dwellers already had started to accept that the city owed them certain services and had gradually developed an unhealthy dependence on City Hall for a variety of services and favors. Such dependence spawned a small devil of corruption that the political spoil system would later loose fully groan. City officials, like state officials, also started to wield their authority to grant charters for political and personal ends. Hospitals, schools, road companies, and banks all had to, quote, prove their value to the community before the local authorities would grant them a charter. No small amount of graft kept crept into systems, quietly undermining Smithian concepts that the community was served when individuals pursued profit. One fact is certain. In 1800, Americans were prolific. Population increases continued at a rate of 25% per decade, 
and the constitutionally mandated 1800 census counted 5,308,473 Americans, double the 1775 number. <clears throat> Foreign immigrants accounted for some of that population increase, but an incredibly high birth rate, result of economic abundance and relatively healthier lifestyle, explained much of the growth. Ethnically, Americans were largely of Anglo-Celtic, Scots and Scots-Irish, and African descent, with a healthy smattering of French, Swedes, Dutch, and Germans thrown in. And of those 5.33 million Americans, 24 of 25 lived on farms in country or in country villages. At least 50% of all Americans were female, and although their legal status was unenviable, it had improved considerably from that of the European women. Most accepted the idea that a woman's sphere of endeavor was dedicated to the house, church, and the rearing of children, a belief prevailed among American men and women alike. Women possessed no constitutional political role. Economically, widows and single women, femme sole, could legally hold property, but they surrendered those rights with marriage, femme covert. Trust funds and prenuptial agreements, an American invention, help some middle-class families circumvent these restrictions. A few women conducted business via power of attorney and other American contractual innovations, and a handful engaged in a cottage industry. None of the professions, law, medicine, midwifery, accepted ministry, and of course the army, were open to females, although in the case of this one aspect of early medical practice, this had to do with less with sexism than it did the physical necessity of controlling large male patients while operating without anesthetic. Women could not attend public schools. Some attended private schools or were tutored at home and no colleges accepted women students. Marriage was designed to ensure that children were cared for financially. Up to a third of all marriages in colonial times involved a pregnant woman. Divorce, for similar reasons, was extremely difficult to obtain. Courts limited the grounds for separation, and in some states, only a decree from the state legislature could affect a marital split. <clears throat> Despite the presentist critique by some modern feminists, the laws in the early republic were designed as much to protect women from the unreliability and volatility of their husbands as to keep them from being under male control. Legislatures, for example, tailored divorce laws to ensure that husbands honored their economic duties to wives even after childbearing age. In stark contrast to white women stood the status of African Americans. Their lot was most unenviable. Nearly 1 million African Americans lived in the young United States, about 17% of the total, a number proportionally larger than today, which is about 12% of the total population. <clears throat> Evolving slowly from colonial days, black slavery was by 1800 fully entrenched. Opponents of slavery saw the institution thrive after the 1793 invention of the cotton gin <clears throat> and the solidific solidification of state black codes defining slaves as chattels, personal, movable personal property. Remember, this is not in the Constitution. The states were trying to change the Constitution by invoking their own statute laws to call slaves property, not people. No law or set of laws embedded slavery in the South as deeply did a single invention. <clears throat> Eli Whitney, the Yankee teacher who'd gone south as a tutor, had conceived his cotton gin while watching a cat swipe at a rooster and gather a paw full of feathers. He cobbled together a machine with two rollers, one of fine teeth that sifted the cotton seeds out, another with brushes that swept the residual cotton fibers off. Prior to Whitney's invention, it took a slave an hour to process a single pound of cotton by hand. Afterward, a slave could process six to 10 times as much. Uh, this was called cleaning the cotton. You had to go through the cotton fibers by hand and pick the seeds out, almost like you do with a watermill. And um, it's a very, very tedious process. And uh, 
So you can imagine how slow it was. In the decade of the 1790s, cotton production increased from 3,000 bales a year to 73,000. 1810 saw the production soar to 178,000 bales, all of which made slaves more indispensable than ever. Somehow, most African-American men and women survived the ordeal of slavery. The reason for their heroic survival lies in their communities and family lives and in their religion. The slaves built true sub rosa societies with marriage, um, children, surrogate family members, and a viable folk culture of music, art, medicine, and religion. All of this they kept below the radar screen of white masters who, if they'd known about these slave activities, would have suppressed them. A few slaves escaped to freedom. Some engaged in sabotage and even insurrections like Gabriel's uprising in 1800 Virginia. But for the most part, black survival came through small day-to-day -day acts of courage and determination fueled by an enthusiastic black Christian church and Old Testament tales of the Hebrews escape from Egyptian slavery. Um, so I, I forgot to mention in this section, we didn't include manumission or buying your freedom, which was still a common but not widespread practice. <clears throat> Especially true in Virginia, slaves there were known to buy their freedom from time to time, and yes, it was true that some freed blacks owned other black slaves. To deny that is as stupid as it is to deny that slavery existed at all, which kind of got the extremes out there. You've got some white people out there trying to make slavery look like it was just some sort of voluntary activity, which is utter nonsense. And then you've got uh, uh, the leftist cadre out there trying to suggest that um, Blacks never got freedom, that they never owned slaves. By about 1850, 1% of slave owners in the South were Blacks. That's a tiny percentage, but it's real. You can't deny it any more than you can deny that slavery was a horrific institution and was kept in place by a combination of raw power from the top down, uh, lack of education of slaves, uh, close supervision, incredibly harsh punishment for anybody who tried to break the system, and religion. And we'll get into this later that Christian religion, ministers in the South played their role in maintaining slavery too. Uh, they can't be excused from that. <clears throat> Between the huge social gulf of master and slave stood a vast populace of plain white folk of the Southern and Western frontier. Usually associated with humble Celtic American farmers, this cracker culture affected and continues to affect all aspects of American life. Uh, one of my co-authors, Dave Doherty, strongly objected to the term cracker, saying it was like the N-word. Um, but that's what the culture was called. Thomas Sowell, the Black economist, has a book called um, White, Black Rednecks and white crackers or something like that but anyway it's um it, it was it was what it was it's what they called themselves and each other and we can't just wipe use the eraser wipe to get rid of terms and words we don't like in the past because they don't work today sorry <clears throat> celtic american frontiersmen across the appalachian mountains and their course unique folk culture arose in the ohio and mississippi valleys. As they carved out farms from the forest, they planted a few acres of corn, small vegetable gardens, cattle, sheep, and ubiquitous hogs. I'm sorry. Uh, cattle, sheep, and ubiquitous hogs, wood splitters, the backwoodsmen called them. Men hunted and fished uh, were left to their own devices in a sort of laissez-faire grazing system. Men hunted and fished, and the women worked the farms, kept house, and born and raised children. They ate mainly meat and corn, pork, beef, hominy, johnny cake, pone, and corn mush. Water was bad, and life was hard, and men drank corn whiskey. 
Frontier diet combined with the hardships of the frontier lifestyle <clears throat> led to much sickness, fevers, chills, malaria, dysentery, rheumatism, and plain old exhaustion. <clears throat> Worms, insects, and parasites of every description wiggled, dug, or burrowed their way into pioneer skin, infecting it with a seven-year itch, a generic term covering scabies and crabs, as well as body lice, which almost everyone suffered from. Worse, hookworm, tapeworm, and other creatures fed off the flesh, intestines, and blood of frontier Americans. Backwoodsmen seemed particularly susceptible to these maladies. Foreign travelers were shocked at the appearance of, quote, the pale and deathly looking people of bluish white complexion. <clears throat> Despite such hardships, frontier folk were content with their hard lives because they knew that the land ownership meant freedom and improvement. Armed with an evangelical Christian perspective, crackers endured their present hardships with the confidence that their lives had improved and would continue to get better. Historian George Dangerfield captured the essence of cracker ambitions when he wrote of their migration, quote, the flow of human beings Beyond the Alleghenies was perhaps the last time in all history when mankind discovered that one of its deepest needs, the need to own, could be satisfied by the simple process of walking towards it. Harsh as the journey was, the movement could not help but be a hopeful one. Okay, that's a really good place to stop. <clears throat> um, I will not be here Monday or Wednesday. I'm going to attend the William Tell Air Combat Exercises, sort of a top gun for international flyers down in Savannah, Georgia. But I will be back here next Friday. In the meantime, consider becoming a VIP. $69 a year, $6 a month. You get six ongoing lesson programs, including Reagan, the American president, which I continue to add to, Integrity, Winston Churchill, and many others that I will be adding to, <clears throat> as well as <clears throat> five other ongoing lesson programs, such as um, <clears throat> the 1620 default, why the 1619 project is wrong. It's about 40 hours of video there. Um, so it's a great enhancement to the rest of your teaching. Now, if you like politics and political commentary, <clears throat> which I have to keep separate here, excuse me, <clears throat> because it's YouTube, go over to the wild world of politics and join up my insider. You'll get a different set of six or seven video series, including my new one, A Patriot's History of Globalism, its rise and decline, but also you'll get my Larry's commentary here right after this show, three days a week, about 10 to 20 minutes of political commentary on the most important news of the day. So check it out. And meanwhile, help me make Patriots history into a feature film. I need your help. Watch the trailer at wildworldofhistory.com and click buy Larry a coffee, get me a coffee and help me make the film. I'll see you guys back here next Friday. <clears throat>